Do you ever sit down to make music and feel completely overwhelmed by the sheer number of options there are in Ableton Live? You've got thousands of sounds, instruments and presets and you spend way more time searching for sounds than actually making music. It's what I call option paralysis and it's a huge creativity killer. But what have I told you? There's a simple Ableton tool that not only helps you escape this trap, but also supercharges your workflow. Today, we're gonna to dive into the most powerful feature you're probably not using, the instrument rack. We'll build one from scratch that contains dozens of sounds and gives you instant access to all of them. And I'll show you a pro tip that allows you to increase the number of instruments you're using and actually decrease your CPU usage. Let's go. The first issue that many Ableton users face is endless options. If you buy the Ableton suite, there is almost every sound that you can conceive available to you. This is a good thing. Take a look here. In your library section over here on the left, if you click on sounds, you can see here there is just a long and endless, endless list of sounds that you can use. You can also go to Ableton and click on packs. As September 25, there are 223 packs available to you, and many of these are free with Suite. So there are just so many sounds that you can download. However, it's really helpful to have a readily available set of core sounds that you can always instantly dial up. Having these ready will massively speed up your workflow and stop getting you lost in options. I've got about 30 sounds that I use all the time and I can quickly access them in any live situation or any session. And I do this by utilizing instrument racks. Okay, so let's build our first instrument rack here. So you can see I've set up a MIDI track. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna drag in my favorite grand piano sound. Which I love this one. Here we come. And that's what you'll normally see. You'll normally see that you get your instrument has appeared here. If you right click on the instrument, click on group, and then you'll see this happen. This is ultimately created an instrument rack, but there are some settings over here, some buttons that we can press to open it up a little bit. So this first button here uh, is the macro controls. We'll get back to them in a second. And the bottom button here is the chain list. We'll need both of those things ticked. So now you can see that your grand piano is held here. Let's say I wanted to add in a different sound, some strings perhaps. I'm gonna click in here. And strings ensemble. Let's go for a deep, nice legato sound. I'm gonna pop that. You drag it down and drop it beneath that grand piano. And what happens now, you have a lovely grand piano and string ensembles that have been grouped together in an instrument rack. Should we hear what happens when I play it? So you can hear that when I play the keyboard, both sounds come out. So there's some settings here that are really useful. You can change the level of the individual different instruments. For example, you can turn the grand piano down. So the strings are more prominent, or you can turn the strings down. And therefore the strings are much less prominent. So that's useful. So you can actually, using an instrument rack, mix more than one instrument together. And that's the first brilliant thing about instrument racks. But that's not actually where the power is. Let's say you wanted to have piano or strings. So these are actually separate instruments. You don't want them to play together. Click here on the chain and you'll see this menu come up. Now, interestingly, you can see there's this blue bar here that you can move around by this. And what this is basically doing is defining ranges within MIDI as to when those instruments will play. And you can see this light blue line here over zero, and that is called chain select or chain selector. Now, the first powerful thing I told you about these macros over here, we're now gonna right click on that chain select and we're gonna say map to macro one. And as you can see, this macro here is now called chain selector. And look what happens if I move it up and down. So this now moves that blue bar along and back. So when the blue bar is here, I get piano. And when the blue bar is here, between sort of 20 and 48, I get strings. So that shows that you can now have two instruments set up really easily and you can have whichever one you want based upon chain selector. Learning to use Ableton is really fun and intuitive, but sometimes you might want a bit more of a structured approach. Production Music Live has some great courses. For example, the beginner to advanced Ableton 12. They've also got some really interesting preset packs, which are basically presets for some of your software instruments like analog, wavetable or operator. So you can download those and then you have hundreds and hundreds of sounds that you can immediately use. The link on the screen or in the description will take you to Production Music Live and any purchase you make there supports the channel. So thanks for checking it out. Okay, so now we've mapped the chain selector to the macro. So now within Ableton, you can move the chain selector up and down here 
by using the map crew. Now that's really useful. So you can see immediately that we can control what sound comes out of my MIDI keyboard with this knob internally in Ableton. So that's really useful. But when you're playing live or when you're next to your keyboard, sometimes having to grab a mouse and make a change with the macro controls within Ableton will actually slow you down. So what I'm going to show you next is how I can map that macro to a hardware device so I can control it myself live. And here you can see my MIDI controller, MIDI mix, which has got loads of knobs and loads of faders. So I can use that as a MIDI controller. So I'm now going to use this to control the macro. So in Ableton, we're now going to do something called MIDI mapping. You can do that by clicking the button here at the top right and the screen goes vaguely purple. And then you turn it off by clicking the same button or control M or command M on a Mac does the same. So now if I press control M, what I now need to do is click on the macro I would like to control. So I click here down on chain selector, and then I move over to my MIDI controller. And I turn the exact knob that I'd like to move this one here. Now back in Ableton, you can see one stroke 18 has appeared above the chain selector. And on the left over here, you can see the details of that mapping. So actually we've got CC18, which was that first knob is now controlling the chain selector. So now if I exit MIDI mapping mode with command M, and I move over to keyboard. So this knob here, far to the left, get a sound, turn it up a little bit, string sound. So if you're rehearsing or performing live with one knob, you can control as many instruments as you'd like on your keyboard live. So that's great. We've now got hardware control of our instrument rack and we can change the instruments on the fly in real time. But when you're performing live and using both hands, that could be a keyboard or a guitar, sometimes you actually can't spare a hand to move an external knob like I just showed you. And here's where the power of automation comes from within Ableton. And to do this, you need to get your head around dummy clips. So back in Ableton, I'm now gonna create a new MIDI clip in the arrangement view here, just by double clicking in bar number two. I'm now gonna stretch that clip to two bars and I'm gonna create a range around that so it loops around that. Now, here we go. We're gonna now create an automation within this clip. So if you double click in this clip, you come up with your standard MIDI note editor, as you can see here. Now, really what we need to get to is the envelope section. This is how we automate different parameters. So click on envelopes. And then what we need to do is find the right envelope. And there's a really helpful way of doing this. If you change the view back to the instruments and move, the chain selector that you're trying to automate. Ableton's very clever. It automatically populates the right automation here. So now to program it, click anywhere on the top line and it immediately creates a thicker line with shading underneath. If you now drag that down to the bottom, if you remember my keyboard knob when it was turned far to the left, it was piano. So zero will be piano. Something like 40%, I think, was the string sound. Let's just try that. So there you go. Immediately you can see within Ableton, I have created an automation that will switch the instruments in the middle of my arrangement. Really, really simple. Now you could also apply that in session view. Let's have a quick look at that now as well. So now we're going to do exactly the same thing. We're going to use MIDI clips to automate this. So I'm going to create a MIDI clip by double clicking and I'm going to name this one piano. So now for piano, remember it's zero. So I'm now just going to create a clip with that at zero. So whenever I play this scene, it's always the piano. Now let's do the same for strings. I'm gonna copy that clip and paste it below. Let's rename this one and call it strings. And now all we're gonna do is gonna lift that number up to like the 40 whatever percent it was. So now if I play this clip. So when you play scene one, the piano will be automatically selected. Whenever you play scene two, the strings will automatically be selected. So if you've got a session view that has a number of different scenes, you can change the instrument on one track between them so it's playing exactly the right thing. You can also do the level of that instrument. You can increase or decrease the delay or reverb effects on it. There's a load of things you can do. So it's a really powerful way to be in complete control of what sounds are playing as you move through a session. Now, this is all very well, but every single instance of an instrument consumes CPU. As you see at the moment, whenever I play this, my CPU chops up the top right to about 20%, absolutely fine. 
Let's try something here where I bring in another 10 or 11 instruments. I'll do that quickly now. Okay, so now I have brought all those instruments in. There's about 12 instruments in there. When you first bring your instruments in, they're all assigned to chain selector zero. You can see the little blue line here is just around zero mark. It's a nice little trick if you wanted to distribute them. If you move, if you expand the bottom one all the way to the end, right click and say distribute ranges equally. Can you see how it's now distributed all of my sounds? So these now will all be selected separately so I won't have any two sounds playing together. But what you can notice at the top right is my CPU is now hovering around 11%. It was much closer to zero when I only had two instruments. So now you can see when I play, the CPU jumps up to close to 30. Now that's okay with one instrument rack with like 10 instruments on it. If you had five instrument racks with 10 or 20 instruments on it, that will pretty quickly get nearer to 50, 60, 70, 80% of CPU and it will kill your computer and your live performance will crash. But it doesn't have to be like this. We can bring this baseline level of 11% down and we can also bring the level when playing down as well. We're going to do this by assigning the on off switch for each of these instruments to the same macro. So watch this. If I right click on grand piano on off button, I say map to chain selector and that's done. Let's now do that for all of the instruments. But that's it. I've now mapped every single one of the on off buttons for each of these instruments to the chain selector. Now here's the power. If you click on map that's at the top here of the chain, you bring up the sidebar here. And what this shows us here is this top one is the chain selector. That's fine. We've mapped the actual chain selector to macro one. We don't need to change this. But then grand piano, what this shows you is the minimum and maximum when this instrument will be on. So if we scroll up at this bottom bit here and hold, hover over this button here, you can see that grand piano is selected when the chain selector is between zero and nine. So if you make this zero, to nine. That now means when chain selector is between zero and nine, piano is on. And when it's above nine, 10 and above, piano is off. So if I go through this, do the next one. Strings ensemble is 10 to 19. So I'll map 10 to 19. And if I go through and do all the rest of the instruments, so collision will be 20 to 29, and I'll go and do all the rest of them. That will mean that as the chain selector chooses the instrument, that will mean that the instrument is only on when it's been selected by the chain selector. Otherwise, it's off conserving CPU power. So that's now done. The first thing you can notice is now my baseline CPU is hovering at about 6%, so half of where it was at before. So turning those 12 instruments off has saved me about 5 or 6% of CPU. Not a lot now, but that adds up in a busy session. As you can see, now when I play the piano, it's a slightly lower number, but it's all small changes. But if you apply this trick, it means that you're in complete control of what instrument is on and kind of your MIDI keyboard or which instrument is off. So there's my pro tip. If you'd like to go further with hands-free performances with Ableton, check out this video here where I show you how to do hands-free live looping, where there are a number of options for you to try.